Good morning, everyone. So uh, if you know Chris Wright, you know that I'm not Chris Wright. Uh, Chris uh, couldn't make it for this presentation and asked me to replace him. I, I can't promise to be as good as, as him, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so my name is Nick Barset. Uh, I work at Red Hat, obviously, as a director of uh, product management for OpenStack. So today, we are going to be talking about what it means to bring uh, cloud-native uh, innovation to the enterprise. And first of all, we need to recognize the fact that what is constantly driving the enterprise today is the, the need for uh, driving a digital transformation. What do we mean by that? Well, if you're an enterprise that was doing taxi, Uber, Uber is doing a digital transformation that you need to be fo following. If you're an enterprise selling books, Amazon has been driving uh, a digital transformation that you are now, uh, you have to follow. If you're in banking, you have the same drive. Everybody's business nowadays is being driven by the need to have their business to be using a new way of offering their services. And in order to do that, there is a few things that needs to happen. So the, 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 the first thing that needs to happen is for the company to realize that they need to do this change. But then, based on what sector they are on, they need to decide how they're going to be organizing this change. But all of this is going to force a change in the infrastructure platform that they have been using. Clearly, if you have uh, the same attitude with your infrastructure platform today that you had 10 years ago, you're not going to be able to cope with change. But that's not enough. That's not enough because it's not just a problem of technology. It's a problem of changing the mindset of the enterprise. The way we've been delivering uh, resources in the enterprise has been a very siloed way, a way where you have, in the worst case, a team taking care of networking, a team taking care of databases, a team taking care of uh, storage, another one taking care of the servers, another one taking care of the wiring. And of course, because they are separate teams, they tend to never communicate together. So we really need to change the culture within the company. We really need to have the company realize that in order to survive, they do have to switch their culture, their processes, and then have that being followed by the technology. But in any case, IT must evolve. It's, it's not anymore a question, do we need to make IT change? It's the change has to happen. And if you know a single company that says, no, I don't need to change, please tell me, I have not met that company yet. So what does it mean? Obviously, we want to go from a in a change in process that goes in the way we handle project management. We want to go from a waterfall uh, model to a more agile model. And let me take a few seconds to talk about the word agile here. When I say agile, I don't imply a, taking a process such as Scrum and applying dumbly to everyone. The only thing that I care when I say the word agile about is how people are going to be able to very quickly have their method evolve within each of the teams. How quickly can the feedback that they are going to be gathering about how they're doing their work is going to be taken into account to modify the process to go faster. And 
when we are uh, talking about this transformation, the goal is what people have labeled DevOps. But if I take the case of Red Hat, DevOps doesn't really make sense. Because in our process, we don't have ops and devs. We more have dev, QE, PMs, um, uh, uh, support engineers, consultant. All these guys need to work together. So DevOps is not uh, more than something that is a, a reference you can uh, use to talk about the same change, but it needs to be adapted. Agile is not Scrum. Uh, Agile is you need to be able to adapt quickly. Another change that you need to do is in your architectures. The way you conceive your applications needs to be evolving. You need to go from big monolithic applications that scale vertically to uh, end tier uh, to eventually get to microservices. You also need to change the way you deploy. We were deploying before on physical servers. We need to evolve to virtual server and eventually to containers. And of course, we need to change the way the application infrastructure uh, is uh, conceived. We were previously talking about Locali localizing application on data centers. We moved the application to hosted uh, data centers. And now we really want the application to be anywhere we want. The same application can be deployed on whatever resources we decide to use, whichever cloud, whether it's internal or external. So this is a lot of change. But the problem that we're trying to solve is this change is something that is not something that you're going to stop. In fact, uh, if, you, if some of you have been to Oscon a few years back, um, uh, a guy uh, named uh, uh, Wardley uh, was doing this great presentation uh, called Situation Normal, Everything Must Change. And this is true, and this is going to remain true over time. So how do we help that? How do we, as a Red Hat, as a software publisher, can help handling this change? Of course, we are not a consulting firm, so we are not going to come into enterprises and explain to them how to organize themselves. What we can do is provide tools that support those changes, that su support those transition, that enables this idea that people must go from one point to another in a smooth way. The notion of Big Bang cannot exist. You do not transform all of your application overnight from monolithic design to a microservice design. That's not true. So we need to think of uh, IT as something that is necessarily an hybrid model. Hybrid in multiple axes. Hybrid in public versus private. Hybrid in the notion of do I deploy on physical server, in VMs, or in container. And I'm sure there is other dimension of hybridity uh, there. But our very important role is and will be always, we need to enable a fast uh, feedback loop. And what do I mean by a fast feedback loop? We need to do something, deploy it as quickly as we can, get the feedback, analyze the feedback, take corrective action, and do it again. And the quicker we go in this loop, the better uh, we are. So I'd like to take uh, a, a few seconds to give you an example, the, the example that we are currently living within Red Hat. Um, when uh, I arrived at Red Hat after the acquisition of Innovance, Red Hat was producing OpenStack the same way Red Hat had been producing RHEL for the past 15 years. And 
One of the things that I realized at this time is our time for delivery of a feature was about a year and a half. From the moment a partner, a customer, was asking for a feature to the moment we were able to put it in their hands, because of our internal processes, it would take a year and a half. And guess what? This is exactly the time you have between two rail releases. And that meant that this process that was in place was perfectly fitting the slow pace of rail at the time. But the reality is that we were dealing with a project called OpenSAC, maybe you know about it, um, and this project has a six-month life cycle. And so people were telling us, but why are you so delayed compared to upstream? And the, the time to uh, delivery for a feature, uh, uh, a year and a half, was a lot of preloading, but also a lot of postloading. Between the time an OpenStack release was made and the moment we could ship it, it would take six months. And obviously, when we looked into it, one of the problems that we found is that our PM team talked once in a while with engineering, we talked in a while with QE, but really what was happening is PM were dumping features, feature requests onto engineering, very schematic here, uh, and engineering would develop, dump their stuff to QE, QE would test, and eventually then we would be able to ship. Unfortunately, this was not working anymore. So what we did was to say, hey, we need to change that model. We need to organize teams in a way where the end-to-end -end delivery of a feature, of a set of feature or a component, is the common goal of a team mixing people from PM, from uh, engineering, from QE, and involve documentation, support, and all other things as early as possible. And, of course, the transformation was not that easy. It was very hard to explain to people why they needed to change the way they worked. And, in fact, even with the best intent, people were always thinking that we had some evil mindset behind it that we were trying to bother them just for the sake of it. And we had to wait for crisis, identify them, to make people realize that this is why they need to change. And this transformation is not complete, but already we've changed our time to market for a feature from a year and a half to eight months. It's huge progress. And I hope to be able, with the team, to reduce it even further. But this is just an example of the transformation that we had to do, which is an example that every industry has to go through. So, talking about our product for a little bit, how do we uh, transform the traditional application stack? Traditional application stack, you've got physical hardware that runs an operating system, rail by preference, of course, um, which can be software that comes pre-compiled or with a runtime environment. Lots of people are using Java or other uh, interpreted languages. And that's about it. You can have multiple applications running um, on the same box but an application is basically confined to one box. And really, where we want to get is the next generation uh, infrastructure. The, this generation, la, starting to be sticky a bit. Um, this next generation uh, application stack can be uh, represented as the base layer is not anymore the server, it's the data center. The layer on top of it is the VIM, the Virtual Infrastructure Manager, OpenStack in our case. The layer above is 
either directly application running within VMs, or we introduce this notion of application orchestration. And this is why everybody is talking about Kubernetes or similar technologies. And the reality is that going from the previous model to this model does not happen in one day. And in fact, we need to be able to help our customer do this transition by providing the tools that deliver this, the tool that help maintain those legacy applications that there is no interest in changing. Why would you change something that worked? while being able to enable these new applications that are going to be communicating with this old application work well together. And every time I hear somebody telling me, oh, tomorrow all applications are going to be designed as microservices running on Docker uh, started by Kubernetes, I'm telling this guy, hey, you should really go spend six months at a customer, see what's the reality there. I know no customers that have more than a single application to keep, take care of that have been able uh, to do a complete transformation even over 10 years, even over 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, what I was hearing, when I, 30 years ago now, sorry, when I started working in computing, I heard, hey, tomorrow there will be no more mainframes. Everything will be done through the client-server model. Where are we at now? There are still mainframes. And there will be, again, mainframes in the future. And as there will be client-server application, because why change something that works? If, you, if the digital transformation is important in the way you, you change your process, but if the application works well in the context of that digital transformation, there is no economic reality that is going to justify modifying what exists. So really, enabling the transformation is what we do. And how do we do that more concretely? Well, first of all, we are transforming the role of the OS. The OS remains very important in any case, whether the OS is what you use when you're inside of a container, or the OS is what you use when you're inside of a VM, or the OS is what you use when you're addressing your individual server in your data center, there is still an OS. It is still the thing that makes the virtual world talk to the physical world. It is still the thing that is making the transition. But what we can do is modularize that OS so that only what is needed is installed where it is needed. A first example of this transformation that we are doing in uh, our OS uh, can be embodied by what you see in the Atomic server, our uh, server dedicated to run containers. And we are going to be evolving on that principle a lot in the next few years. The second thing that we are offering is not one, but two virtual uh, infrastructure manager model. One which is based on OpenStack, and another one which is based on uh, steel KVM, but a KVM model that is closer to traditional virtualization. But why, why are we doing this? Because we know that some application need the old virtualization model to build their uh, full tolerance model. And as we progress, it is clear that OpenStack gets more and more full tolerance for application uh, functionality. And there will be a point where the two products will be merging in one way or another, because we will have feature parity between the two. But in the meantime, offering a common networking layer between the two uh, models. Both are using Neutron. A common storage model between the two uh, frameworks. Both are using Cinder. Is the way we help the companies that are transitioning from one model to another 
to maintain continuity between the environments. And if we go up one level, if we think that there is going to be applications that are going to be running in VMs, and applications that are going to be developed to run within um, uh, an orchestration environment using containers, microservices, these microservices that are running either on top of Rev or on top of OpenStack, do you think they will need to talk with their VM application or even with the bare metal application that the company is still deploying? Yes, of course. It's not because your database is still hosted on some mainframe that the microservice application won't need to be able to talk to it. And this is why we are hard at work to make sure that our networking layer, Neutron, in all cases, is being efficiently used by our orchestration layer when deploying containers. And that's the career project within OpenStack. This way, we are able to enable continuous flows of information throughout the IT regardless of the stage of evolution of the applications of the, or the various applications uh, in, in IT. Does this make sense? I see a few people nodding. At least I haven't put everyone to sleep yet. Thanks. So another way we are trying to help is to address the same problem from two very different perspectives. The first perspective is the perfect perspective of the developer. And as a developer, let's imagine I'm a developer for a second. Those that have seen my code will wish that I'm not. Um, as a developer, the only thing I care about is how am I going to be developing the next application? What's the next stuff? What's a great way to, to build my application tomorrow? And that's great. And this is why when we talk with developers, we will always emphasize our uh, Kubernetes-based solution called OpenShift. We're not going to be talking about OpenStack that much. Well, it's not completely true because there is a small fringe of developers that I could qualify as system developers that really care about having access to a full OS. And with this, these guys will be having a slightly different talk. But in general, in 90% of the cases, we'll be addressing the developer population of an enterprise with the tooling that we have to build microservice-based applications. On the other hand, when we are talking with operators, the, these are people that care about how do I plug my network into that box so that that application can eventually get an IP address. And these guys, they need to, to understand how the translation is working between the physical world and the virtual world. And what is offering that? That's a Vim. And our next generation Vim, based on OpenStack, Red Hat OpenStack platform, is the way we approach this population. So a lot of people think that we are building two competing products. And in fact, if I take a poll internally at Red Hat with the developers that are developing each, a lot of them think that they are competing uh, products because, hey, they are doing roughly the same thing. They are putting bits, bits in a box. So box equals box equals competition. But that's not the case. They are building a tool that is complementary. People that tell me, oh, tomorrow with Kubernetes, I'll be deploying on bare metal servers by the thousands, and I will have no problem. Well, those people have never looked at what it meant to be interacting with the physical layer or with an SDN, or with hundreds of storage uh, vendors. One of the fantastic strengths of the OpenStack project is not coming from the quality of its code. Whether it is good or not doesn't really matter at this stage. 
the real value of the uh, OpenStack uh, project is coming from A, the variety of the, uh, of the contributors, B, the ecosystem that has formed around it, and the variety of options that you have when you deploy OpenStack, regardless of storage, networking, whatever. What's really important in there is that we are solving the virtualization problem independently of the application story, and we have a great tool in the middle, this orchestrator, Kubernetes, as we made uh, a strong choice there, that is offering the uh, point where the two are meeting. And we are actively contributing to Kubernetes um, to offer all the bridges necessary to ensure maximum transparency between the models. I mentioned Courier, but the same efforts have been done in Cinder, in Manila, and there is going to be more. So, now let's take a look for a second at uh, a little survey that we did on our customer base. So we sent to every email address of a customer we could think of a survey, uh, asking them to answer a few questions, and uh, 150 unique customers answered. Out of these 150, we were really, really pleased to see a year-over-year -year increase of 17% of the number of people going to production with OpenStack. Okay. We also saw an increase in the question, are you planning to use a, a platform as a service, aka OpenShift or its competition? We also saw an increase on the uh, number of people planning to use containers on top of OpenStack. So there is no doubt, OpenStack is a mature product. You wouldn't have 42% of our customer deploying it in, in production if that was not the case. OpenStack is a platform on which people want to run paths and or containers. Another uh, question that we ask is, where should we invest? And we made a very stupid mistake of asking a too open question. The first one was, do you think that simplified installation is important? We got 69%. But did, we, did they mean installation of application on top of the cloud? Or did they mean uh, simplified installation of the cloud itself? Well, I can bet that we have, again, this ops versus dev point of view here. From the dev side, simplified uh, deployment of my application is obviously going to be my main concern. From the ops side, simplified deployment of my OpenStack platform is of course going to be my main concern. So yes, they are all caring about that, and I don't think we learned much about it. Except that I could talk for five minutes about it. Um, now, 55% of them were strongly in favor of having support for complementary solution. None of them think that there is one project that will rule them all. And it shows that, in many ways, our customers, with their business needs, have a much clearer picture of what their tomorrow is going to be than we have, at least from the perspective I have from within Red Hat. Also, 53% um, told us it was very important for them when they were selecting a, a vendor that it was that their vendor had some type of leadership in the communities for which they were building products upon. And yes, if you're building a product, if you're building the, your a product based on community bits, you'd better be participating actively in that community. That doesn't mean that you need to rule it. I mean, um, there are, if you look at Red Hat uh, as a wide uh, contributor, Red Hat is sometime the leader in contribution to some projects. Red Hat is sometime one of uh, the 
uh, main contributors. But in all cases, we always prioritize the investment in the community over anything else. In fact, you must have heard that a hundred times, but we have a base philosophy which is, let's do things upstream first. And why do we want to uh, focus on this idea of upstream first? Because it is the only sustainable way to build a product on top of community-based bits. I, if you want, after this, because I don't like to name people uh, on stage, I could give you the example of at least five companies that were uh, highly involved in the early stage of the uh, OpenStack project and that have completely disappeared from the scene. And in every case, they had one thing in, in common. They were forking. They were building add-ons as monkey patches or whatever uh, technology they decided to use. And who is remaining now? Only the guy that really got it. In fact, I'll give you an example uh, of a very, very positive evolution of our community. But in any case, we need to be focusing on the core services within the upstream community. We need to be adding the value that our customers are ask, asking for by working on our influence in the community. If a customer is asking me for a feature and nobody re recognizes me as a valid contributor to that community, what are the chances that this feature is going to get in? Of course, our role as a distribution of an upstream community is to be mitigating the risks. And we still have to do stuff downstream. But the last thing it is, it is to produce bits that are not accessible to others. We might change configuration from what the default in the community is. We might uh, uh, change a few logo here and there. We might do quality assurance. We may be backporting bugs for longer. And a bunch of other things like tech support and documentation that nobody cares about. Um, but in, in no cases have I seen an example of a valid reason to do a fork to carry specific patches. When you look at our investment in some of the communities that we have, these are not scientific numbers. They, they can be contested in many ways. But one thing remains. In all the projects that we ship, we have some kind of a major investment in that community, whether it is in the OpenSAC project, the Kubernetes project, uh, or the OpenNV project, we get people on the ground contributing code to it. I don't think anybody can contest that, and I think I've explained why. So one question is, hey, as a user, as a customer, as uh, a partner, how can I help? Or I could formulate it in another way. How can I get this one thing I really care about that nobody else care about? And my simple answer is, come on, join us. Contribute upstream. This is how you're going to be uh, getting what you want out of OpenStack, out of any project you're talking about. And secondly, make sure that you stop building vertical teams. Stop putting people that do the same thing in the same management group, they are going to build a little kingdom that will talk as little as possible to every other kingdom. Because when you have a kingdom, talking to another kingdom is called a war. Now, it's, Game of Thrones is a bad analogy here. Also, when you're building a dev team or an ops team, that is going to be involved in OpenStack. Don't expect them to only be servicing your cloud need. 
please give them time to contribute back to the OpenStack project because this is how they're going to learn more about the OpenStack project. This is how the OpenStack project is going to better suit your own need. And this is how we are all going to be more successful together. And a very good example of this is the announcement that we made uh, last week, just before Summit. It's a very good example because it's a case of a major vendor with whom we've been working for ages that has tried other models and finally came to realize that contributing upstream first was the right way to go. And we've announced that we are going to be working together on this contribution. We are going to be helping them on learning the processes. They are going to be helping us in bringing years of uh, expertise in an area where we are not experts. In fact, Red Hat is experts in many things, in so many things that we are experts nowhere. We are very good generalists. So having a partner such as Ericsson uh, to help us succeed in uh, uh, multiple markets, including the enterprise, including the telco markets, is really a great thing for us. And thankfully, all the efforts that we've put in the past five years are starting to pay off. At last summit, we announced a few customers, not very significant, only f four of them, if I remember correctly. Well, yesterday, hello? Yesterday, I don't know if you noticed, but we made a, a small announce where we announced four more. Um, I don't know if you've heard of BBVA, at least if you look around uh, when you walk uh, in the city, you should see a few signs. Uh, it's uh, a major bank in Spain. Um, you might have heard of uh, Betfair. Betfair is uh, the largest uh, betting platform, I think, in Europe. They are handling 130 million uh, transactions per uh, day, if I remember correctly, which is huge. And they are doing it completely on top of OpenStack. You certainly never heard of Froduban, but Froduban is the IT arm of Santander, and I think you've heard of Santander, uh, another major bank, and CA Mobile. And we are also announcing another wave today of customers that have decided from the telco world to work with us. So it's not just anymore the idea of working together. It's concrete example of people that are satisfied enough of their experience with OpenStack that are coming up telling the world, hey, we are doing it, and look, we are having incredible business returns based on this work. I don't know if you've read the, 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 this present, great presentation that was done, I don't even remember where, I think it was OSCON, um, titled No CEO Ever. But clearly, having a customer be displayed, what, what happened there? Be displayed uh, on this list is the demonstration that the CEO did see value in the end result of a transformation that we helped them initiate. That this transformation was successful, that we were able to provide the value that they were expecting. So this concludes my presentation. These are the sessions that you missed, done by other Red Hat guys uh, yesterday. Don't worry, there are more to go coming today. There are plenty of sessions uh, done by Red Hat guys, so I invite you to come and see them. And, uh, yeah, the, the schedule is starting to run by itself. I don't know why. Interesting. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. I think I'm out of time for questions in the audience, but I'll remain around for a bit if you have questions. Thank you.